you will get it that is besides the point. Now come back to our science this boy was in the class and Albert Einstein was talking big things about physics E is equal to mc squared blah blah blah. This boy got up and said sir you are wrong and you are talking through your hat and all your thinking is wrong that is not the correct formula and he gave a formula p q e is not equivalent to q p. This is called the uncertainty principle and what happens to a student who gets up and tells his professor you are wrong what happens? He becomes an outstanding student. Yes, his name was Werner Heisenberg. He became an outstanding student for 31 years. This was in 1925. He propounded the uncertainty principle PQ is not equivalent to QP, and it was in 1956, after Albert Einstein died in 55, that he gets the Nobel Prize for Physics. The only Nobel Prize which is worth its weight probably not even in diamond, platinum is worth its weight of, of something which is very, very good. Now that is the principle which changed science. So if you think, you know, the, have you heard of the fish net hypothesis? Fish net hypothesis. Anyone? You are all ichthyologists, right? You know ichthyology? Studying fish. So ichthyologists wanted to start science. So they said, okay, we will study fish. So they went to the sea and had a net, collected the fish, brought it to their laboratory and measured it with what I was seeing there, some measure, weight measure and something, you know, Werner, Vernier caliper or whatever they measured and came a hypothesis. They wrote a piece, piece, it became a PhD thesis saying that all fish in the sea are bigger than two inches in size. Became a hypothesis. It was accepted by the peer reviewing committee. And it was published in the International Journal of Ichthyosis. Right? Then what happened? It went on. Everybody accepted it because the market, immediately it was taken to the market. So market said any fish bigger than two inches is sea fish, come on, I will sell it. They made money. So science is money making money. And then somebody was, a, there was a thinker called P.C. Thomas who said, why every fish must be too bigger than two inches? So P.C. Thomas went to the sea with a smaller net hole. So he caught less than two inches also. So science is called fish net hypothesis. This hypothesis was propounded by a great Nobel laureate physicist. His name is Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington. Eddington was a contemporary of Einstein. Actually, to make Einstein great in the textbooks, this Eddington is responsible. So Eddington brought him to the English speaking world. Einstein was not even known because what work Einstein quoted was all original work of Lawrence, Poincare and Fitzgerald. And Einstein's wife nicely plagiarized it and wrote a paper putting the, all the things together because they all wrote it in 1899, she wrote it in 1905 and together they published it. And some or other, you know, the rest is history, you all have read that. You have read the history but not the truth. Most of the time history is not the truth. Now coming back to our friend Eddington, Eddington put forward this hypothesis saying that Science is not sacrosanct. Science cannot really answer any question. Certain questions science can never answer. Like for example, is there God? A MSc scientist will say, no, not likely because I have not seen him. I can't measure him in my laboratory. So where is God? PhD scientist says, there is no God. Forget about it. There is no God at all. How can he be there? I have not seen him. I am a PhD. How can he be there? So God doesn't exist. But then a thinking Nobel laureate whose name is Peter Medever, wrote a beautiful book, small book, read it. It's difficult, not difficult to read, about 104 pages. It's called Limits of Science. Book's name is Limits of Science, where he says, come sir, why did you sit down? Our Australian friend. I know, he believes, latest science to scientific research in medicine says, sitting in the chair reduces your lifespan. I'm not joking. That is called reductionist science. You just collect a cohort of people and then say how many hours they sat, how many hours they worked and things like that and come to some conclusion, immediately write a paper. After some time, someone else will write and say, standing is bad for health. This is, this is called reductionist science. Reductionist science. You know, you must have had so many papers saying coffee is very good for health. And your equal number of this, so coffee is very bad for health. 
Like for example, you all thought fish is very good for health. It's got, you know, what is that called? Um, omega 3, this, that and all. All these are created, you know, fat. Fat was fat. We all knew fat. Now we created caste system in fat. Saturated fat, unsaturated fat, semi-saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, omega fat, this fat, that fat. All fat is no good or good. Actually, the man who did this study of fat and health, the first man, his name is Ansel Case. Ansel Case was given 110 million, 110 thousand dollars to find out the relationship between fat and heart disease. So Ansel Case went, he went to Australia, he went to Malaysia, he went to India, he went to uh, Japan, he went to USA, studied groups of people. And then put it together in a XY graph, you know, that's what you do, no? One next year, one next year, this fat here and heart attack here, it was not a straight line. Whenever you are given grant money, you are indirectly told you must get positive results. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not joking, man. I'm not joking. Am I joking? No, 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 no. What I am talking here, I may make it look a little hilarious, but it's not just the science, 100% science that I'm talking to you. So Ansel Case had real problem. So he sat. This is called doctoring your data. So he sat down. And then, what to do? I must get a straight line. So, he sat and maneuvered, 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 maneuvered. After 22 countries he studied, he eliminated, very conveniently, 15 countries. <laughs> I mean, it's, nobody knows, no? If you, if you read his paper, you don't know this. But you must go deep into it, you will get to know. Now, what happened? He got a straight line. At the bottom was Tokyo, Japan. At the top was USA and in between Germany, US, US and some four or five countries. Australia was not there because it, is eliminated. It, it was eliminated. So he wrote a paper in 1951 saying that fat is the be all and end all of atherosclerosis and heart disease. 1961, there was a thinking biochemist in London University. He is a very, very interesting fellow. This fellow did a study, same data he took. Instead of fat, he took sugar. So you put sugar in the x-axis, heart attack in the y-axis and straight line. <laughs> and he said, cane sugar is the be-all and end-all of atherosclerosis. 1963, I had a colleague of mine in the London University, we were working together. He was a very good cardiologist. So he was collecting data on number of trousers sold in Europe since the Second World War and heart attack. So he put the thing, straight line again. What does it mean? Since the Second World War, there was affluence in Europe. Europe had more money, so people ate more sugar, people ate more fat, people buy, bought more trousers. And now this is called the, the, what is called parallelism. These two things go up. If you have a lot of money, don't you buy two trousers? Suppose if you didn't have money, you'll buy only one trouser. If you still didn't have money, you'll only have a loincloth. So this is, this is the, what happens in society. But then, you call it a cost effect. That's a dangerous thing. Now, omega-3 came, omega-6 came, omega-3 went away. Now, there are enough papers to say eating too much omega-3 is very bad for the heart. So, this is not real science. This is called reductionist science. Where you reduce everything into two bits and have some relationship. I'll tell you now, you all get worried. Oh, my, my tummy is big. Uh, my sugar is slightly on the higher side. There's a thing called cholesterol, I believe. I don't know what that is. It's a white powder, I know. It does, it's a harmless thing. You, you need it. If you don't have cholesterol, you will die because every cell wall is cholesterol. Did you understand that? And you get billions of cells every day being new formed. Okay, I said you are all six months old. To be six months old, you must have plenty of cholesterol. Now, if a doctor goes and you reduce your cholesterol, probably you will meet your maker a little faster, quicker. That's all what happens. Now, anyway, all this came, all this went. They were all connected. Then we had a study called Mr. Fit Study, MRFIT, Multiple Risk Factor Intervention Trial, which started 25 years ago. And when it started in the 80s, President Nixon was the president. So he reluctantly sanctioned $150 million for this study, $150 million, and told them, this enormous amount of money, I want very strong results, very strong positive results. Did you get the, all that now? Okay. It went on. It studied 500,000 Americans, picked up 100,000 Americans and followed them up now for 25 years. In the first five years, they said, oh, yes, 
reducing cholesterol, reducing your sugar, reducing your blood pressure is very good for you. It went on and on and on. At the 25th year, somebody analyzed it to find out that risk factor interventions with the drugs or surgery will reduce the risk factors, but not the risk of premature death. Did you get that? Risk factors will only reduce the risk factors. In short, this is surrogate evidence of something. Like for example, I have a nice slide. Today I didn't bring slides because I thought, no, I don't, shouldn't show you slides. I have a nice slide for global warming. Somebody got Nobel Prize for global warming. Nothing has happened. Globe has been warmer than this 100 years ago. Don't worry about that. Now somebody produced global warming data. I have a surrogate evidence. I have a slide which shows women's underwear since the 18th century. In the 18th century, the underwear was very big. You know, it used to come almost up to the knee. Then it became smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It's almost invisible now because its globe is <laughs> globe is warming. You know, <laughs> what is that called? Surrogate evidence. And the MR fit study showed that at the end of 25 years, intervened people died more than the not intervened people. Did you get that? Whose blood pressure, sugar, everything was tightly controlled with the drugs. They were not there, but the others were there still. It's like Yale University kept a record of their gold medalists in athletics. The gold medalists were not there after 50. The silver medalists were still there up to 60. The bronze medalists were running till 70. And the also rans were there 80, 90 and all. You'll be surprised, a study was done in French nursing homes. Nursing homes in there means, doesn't mean in the Indian concept of nursing home. Nursing home is old age home. And there were ladies 80, 90 years old. They had cholesterol 800, 900 and all. So the study said, if you have very high cholesterol, you live long. Which is true actually, which is true. So friends, this is a science that we are talking about. That's called the science of fish net hypothesis. So, Peter Medever wrote, science cannot answer questions because science is not holistic. Science is not designed to answer such questions. Science can say, how big is the fish? Why is the fish in the sea? Why is some fish not in the sea? Why are some fishes in the river? Science doesn't answer. Where is God? Science doesn't answer. So, he says, science is only designed for a particular purpose. Like for example, railway engine is designed to run on a railway track. Supposing you go and say, I want this railway engine to fly like a plane, it can't do. So a question is science, can science answer God? No, because it can't. It's not designed to answer God. So science, don't think science is the end of everything. Actually, I would recommend you a good book. It's called Against Method. What's the book's name? Against Method. Our professor from Bombay must read this. Hmm? Because, you know, he's teaching science. So, Against Method. This is written by a man called Peter... Fire up bed. F E Y. -E